Hello, fellow listeners. I'm Brie Pelty and the guest producer on this week's episode of the Sam Taylor Podcast. Before we get started, I thought I'd share a few things about myself. I am Ojibwe and originally from Ontario from a community called Wukwemekong First Nation. And I'm currently a Dalhousie University student and I recently completed my first year of the Commerce Co-op program. Before moving to Nova Scotia, I served in the military as a medical technician for nearly six years before taking quite the turn to pursue the CPA route in designation. Along the way, I've met a lot of great people, Sam Taylor being one of them. She was my very first accounting instructor at Dell. And while we're on the topic of changing careers and moving away from home, today's conversation is with Chris Grimes Gord, a West Coaster turned East Coaster, a CPA turned CFO, and a firm believer in chasing opportunities, even if they find you moving across the country. Chris began his career in core assurance in his home province of BC and eventually made the move to Nova Scotia to take on his current role as Chief Financial Officer of Ocean Trout Canada. This episode highlights the value of making connections, overcoming challenges at any and all points in your career, playing to your strengths, and realizing you're not alone if you still don't know what you want to be when you grow up. If you're interested in connecting with Chris or myself, our details will be listed in the description. And if you want to hear more about a day in the life of a CFO and the process of taking a company public, stay tuned and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Chris Grimes Gore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. And thanks for pretending like that's the first time we've started pressing record. Uh, it, because it was. Yeah, yeah it was. I, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, Chris, I like to start this off with an icebreaker question for you. I'm wondering, what is your favorite way to kick off a meeting? Uh, personal conversations and introductions. Uh, and, and that's more of uh, we don't need to always jump right into work. So let's get to know each other a little bit. Uh, but I don't have any good icebreakers. Like I don't have any go to what's your favorite color, your favorite animal type of thing. No, I like that. That because then it's it's truly not like hey if you were an animal what animal would you be it's like hey what did you do this weekend like what did you do for fun like go anywhere cool like eat anything awesome and getting to know some of your teammates a little bit better so I uh I like that has that shifted over your career like were you at like earlier on were you kind of like a here's the agenda let's do this no chit chat in the agenda I, I think I I would that that's accurate because I think the the earlier in my career I was the more nervous I was and so it was I have an agenda that I can jump into and we can get to that uh, but COVID and, and this kind of working remotely thing has has really changed some of that too because you don't have the same kind of water cooler talk that you used to uh, and so you have to try and get to know people in a bit of a different way and it's tough to build relationships through computers at least for for me uh, so you end up spending or, or we try to spend a bit more time having chit chats beforehand before you jump right into the you know, the nitty gritty accounting stuff. Yeah, completely. It's weird. I feel like I've kind of lived a little bit of a, a double life because pre-COVID I had worked in an office, but I'd also worked remotely uh, for the CPA Western School of Business. Right. And so, and I always joke, like, I'm like, Cammie's my favorite boss. And I've seen her like three or four times in person, right. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, I also think time. So it's like intent and time. If you worked for 10 years with somebody and you know you speak to them once a month or once every couple of months, but the, those interactions add up and if they're always positive, but if you want to build that relationship in a shorter amount of time, like you need more than just, you know, casual, more than chance. Like you kind of have to like make your own luck and kind of, and work for that, work yep. for that relationship really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really relationships are foundational to, to everything we do. So um, Even as an accountant, I I know shocking, yeah, shocking. That's, I agree. Uh, yeah, I I think so. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's uh, give people the goods. So, Chris, uh, how do we know each other? That's a that's a good question. So we know each other because of relationships, uh, yeah. and and we uh, we connected through a previous guest that you've had that I think you went to university with with, with Gordon. Oh, um, oh my gosh, it was uh, if not junior high, elementary. Oh, like that we go way back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My parents and I were actually talking about this, uh, like last week and she, they're like, Oh, Gordon, he was great. Like, and, uh, we went after we ran into each other, uh, in, or sorry, after like junior high, we may have gone to high school. I'm not quite sure, but I would run into him in random places in Calgary every okay. like year or two, like a Safeway, a right. dance club, a <laughs> right. <laughs> like, 
out on town. So yeah, relationships. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. So so Gordon and and Gordon was uh, was a guy that I used to work with um, and in Calgary and who where I'm not from and and uh, he yeah we connected remotely and got to know each other and then I moved out to Halifax and he said hey you should connect with this ex elementary school colleague of mine uh, <laughs> and that's how we connected and and it was sort of a bit of a cold call it was a, hey I just settled here in Halifax and uh, wouldn't mind getting a bit of lay of land yeah. Uh, and then you know COVID and all the shutdowns and open open ups and shutdowns and open ups and like it's like hey cool uh, I'm sure we'll still grab that beer um, yeah. you know with our each other and significant others uh, but at the same time it was cool to just like hop on a Teams call or a Skype call and yeah get to get to know you a bit so thanks for agreeing uh, to be on the show now you mentioned that you weren't originally from Calgary so. Maybe on your way to letting us know how you became a CPA, CA, uh, and became uh, becoming a designated accountant, kind of how did you arrive to Calgary and what's the backstory there? Yeah, so born and bred on the West Coast. Um, and uh, and so I, I grew up in just outside of Vancouver, uh, went to school in Vancouver, and then started working uh, at a mid-sized firm. So I did my undergrad in accounting. Um, I started in political science, actually, and realized I didn't want to be a uh, teacher uh, or a lawyer, so I, I kind of fell into accounting, um, and uh, and then I got a I got a job at a midsize firm in Vancouver, wrote the UFI because I'm of that age, uh, and then after I passed, I it was kind of a time in Vancouver when when the economy was weak, and so Calgary was kind of the the shining shining light, and so I moved to Calgary, and I mean it was six months later that oil went from like a hundred down to thirty dollars a barrel, and so rode that way, oh, yeah. but I was there for about eight years and then uh, came out to came out to Halifax. But yeah, so so I'm a I'm a CACPA or CPACA uh, CASV school graduate, uh, and and yeah, went through the UFI process. And um, out of curiosity, at, what year did you write? 2013. Okay, so okay, I'm a I'm a 2010. So okay. we're right around right around yeah. the same. But it's interesting to kind of see you know, when the merger first happened, being like, what's this going to look like? And now yeah. we're into competency map 2.0, um, where it's just kind of feels like that kind of merger-esque type, at least to me a little bit. And I'm like, yeah. oh, what's this going to look like? Yeah. And just being like, you know, as much as we, like, we're going to go through lots as accountants and as a profession, like we've already been through lots. So, you know, and, yeah. it, and it goes by quick. Like that wasn't that long ago, but it was. Yeah. And, and it was always, well, like I, so I don't even know what the competency, competency mapping 2.0 is. Like I'm, I'm far removed from it now. Um, I'm but, in education, so I, I need to know. <laughs> and in like two years when it's starting to be actioned on, then you can start to kind of like, right. yeah, look at it. But yeah, yeah. It's uh, but you know, it, it's, it's a great, it's a great designation regardless if it was the CGA, CMA or CA and now the CPA. Uh, but it never really made a whole lot of sense in Canada to have three separate designations uh, for one, really one profession. Uh, and I do think that the the merger, from my perspective, because it was an intentional choice when I graduated of which way you were going to go, the merger just sort of levels the playing ground for everybody because we all kind of do the same thing, but we have different skill sets based on our experience. And and you know now there's no, I don't know, I think there's a perceived hierarchy at one point that wasn't justified because there's great CAs and really bad CAs and there's great CGAs and really bad, like that, that's just what it is. So it, I think, it, I think the unification was a good move for the profession. Yeah. I think that's a really good point because I think as like CAs, sometimes uh, we would have some things that were shone like brightly, but then at the same time, there was other things that people would say, uh, like, oh, you can't talk to humans or you're you're not dynamic or like we can't put the CA in front of a board. Yep. Um, whereas, you know, then other, um, you know, designations had their, their pros and their cons. But when I saw the education part, they literally tried to take the best and, um, and highlight those in each and therefore compensate out, you know, not uh, some of these perceived or actual, um, you know, Ooh, just things that weren't as effective. So right. I really right. think that's a great perspective. And, you know, like, who knows, like, there's no 
parallel universe that I'm aware of where it's like we got to see what it looked like before like without the merger and I have to look around and I look at the program that you know we're sending our undergrads into and I'm really proud of it I'm proud of what it was and how it's developed and shaped and I'm proud of like the the product that is going in and our colleagues like our accounting colleagues so you know absolutely I think it's um it's a good thing and I look forward to seeing what else is out there because we have to shift and change. You know, if you li if literally, you know, four months ago, you asked your computer to do something and Alexis would play the wrong song. And now you're asking it to solve research questions and you're getting out sometimes these like scarily good answers. You know, yeah. you kind of have to shift and bend and like be adaptive and not just say you're adaptive. Yeah, yeah. I, I do not envy you and the education system with with the AI evolution that is taking place right now. Uh, yeah, that, that is a scary new, new universe. It's scary and it's new, but it's also really kind of cool as far as, you know, we get to pilot in, in many aspects, like how to be adaptive and robust. And, you know, just as we are going back in person, I think for, you know, like for the foreseeable future, cause we were back yeah. and then back and then back and then um, it's like, okay, this is resilient, resilient again. And then what's the learning objectives here? Like, what do we want people to know? And within that, it's talking to people in the profession saying, Hey, what would be helpful for you? What would be an ideal team member look like? And make sure that we strengthen those, um, or keep those bonds and that connection really strong. Um, so like, thank you. I, I don't know. I'm excited partly because, um, I'll be excited for anything that doesn't include a lockdown at home. Really? Sure, like yeah. I, I really, I, I like my alone time, but like, it needs to be balanced out with like some good people. Time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. Okay. So Chris, what brought you out to Nova Scotia? Yeah. So I took the role of chief financial officer of Ocean Trout Canada. Uh, so we are a 25 year old uh, aquaculture company that focuses on the production of steelhead trout. Um, company reorganized about five years ago and refocused from Ontario into Atlantic Canada. Uh, and then we got pretty serious uh, just right around when I joined of refinancing and taking the company into operation again. So we're, we're sort of a, we're a 25 year old company that's operating much like a brand new start in, in sort of sustainable protein production. Um, and it was, you know, I got the opportunity through a relationship as I think this, there's going to be a vein of that through this entire conversation um, but, uh, I got the opportunity to come in at, at the CFO level out of, uh, PwC. And it was kind of one of those things that when you get offered that job or you get the opportunity, um, you, you, you take it, or at least I take it. Um, and so my wife and I packed up and, and we left the West coast and we moved to Halifax to take on the role. Um, and we've been here for, yeah, just coming up on 18 months now. Wow. Yeah. What was, uh, what was it like moving for work? Because I think that's something that nobody ever really talks about. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done it twice because I went from Vancouver to Calgary. Uh, and then I went Calgary back to Vancouver and then Vancouver out here. Uh, I remember going Vancouver to Calgary was harder because I was 24. Um, and I didn't really know. I didn't really know why I was going other than Calgary promised great opportunity. Uh, and I love Calgary. Like it, that, that's a city that that will always be in my heart, and it may be a city we live in again at some point. But that one was really difficult because it, it I wasn't straight out of university, but my entire world was in Vancouver, and then I went somewhere new. Um, and then Calgary, you know, it was a it was a great time. I worked at two really good firms out there. Um, coming out to Halifax was a little different because I'm a bit older. Uh, I'm married, so I came with my wife, came with our dog, uh, and so it you know there was less of the unknown or the concern about how do you build a life here because we were sort of bringing our life uh, but I do think that there's something to be said about you know going into a smaller market which Halifax is uh, with and getting opportunities that you may not be afforded in a bigger market like Toronto uh, I've got a lot of public company accounting experience advisory um, that sort of stuff and that that is a harder skill set to find in Halifax uh, based on the experience because those are really typically headquartered through Vancouver, uh, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal. Uh, so, so yeah, it was a big move. Um, I hate being this far from my parents. Um, and, and that's difficult, but you know, I, I, I'm somebody who wants to chase the opportunities when I can. No, completely. Um, and I can relate, um, 
Yeah, with being far away from family, but also being able to take advantage of opportunities and be excited and know that, yeah, you can not just rebuild. I like how you said, bring it, you know, you're bringing your family and you're bringing that experience and it's completely different. I feel like a lot of people would have maybe said that it's harder to kind of move cities for a career now versus when you're 24. So it's really cool. Uh, No, so it's really cool to hear your perspective because, uh, you know, anything that's kind of counterintuitive and that makes a lot of sense. Like when you're 24, you're a lot closer, like what your life looked like in university and the different lifestyles. Um, But when you're a little bit older, you have different priorities and life looks different and what you value looks different. So well, and and maybe if if I hadn't have done the move to Calgary, maybe Mm. I wouldn't have ever made like, well, I, I wouldn't have because I wouldn't have made the relationships based out of Calgary, but, you know, doing it once, like, you know, the first time is always the hardest. Uh, and I remember, like, I remember my mom dropping me off at the airport and it was like the saddest day. <laughs> like, you know, these two, like, it, it's like the movies, like my mom and I just yeah. bawling our eyes out, oh. like at the airport, just, just, and it's an hour away. Like, it, you know, Calgary's <laughs> not far from Vancouver, but like, it was like, <laughs> it, it was this thing. And, uh, and don't get me wrong. It was difficult to come again, but uh, yeah, it, it was it was easier because the, you know, this was an opportunity. Uh, and again, bringing, bringing the life with me, uh, in some ways. And, and thankfully my wife agreed. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. It's, but like, I moved away from Calgary for the first time. So away from home, uh, when I was like 30 to here for work. And like, I, people, there was a lot of interesting conversations and I'm like, no, it's fine. Like if I want to go like back, A, I can go back. Um, I can visit back. I can, you know, I took up some like, you know, teaching stuff where they paid me to go back and stuff a little bit. Right. So it's like, if you want to, you can, I don't want to say you can do it all because there's definitely trade-offs, but there's, it's not linear and it's not one or the other. And it's not like forever if you don't want it to be. So there's a lot of choice and flexibility versus thinking about it like these big like they are big decisions but it's never just like one and done and like then it's all bad and you know so and my best friend like moved to Vancouver another one stayed in Calgary we still talk a lot I don't know it's just it is what you make of it and uh, again sometimes I look at our students and some of them move from China or from Dubai or from like Pakistan and you know I definitely take that into consideration when once in a while I'm like oh I really wish I just had like a you know, Coco Brooks pizza. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's okay, Samantha. Yeah. Um, so Chris, what, uh, you mentioned assurance because being a CPA, CA means you likely had um, some, like were in assurance for a bit. Yeah. What did your path look like uh, when you were in the firm? And then um, could you be a little bit more explicit on the relationship if you want um, yeah, that brought yeah. you out to Halifax? Yeah, sure. So, so I, yeah, I started core assurance at a mid-sized firm in Vancouver. Um, and I wrote the, wrote the UFI out there. Uh, so I spent two years working in Vancouver, core assurance, you know, kind of bread and butter, junior mining for, you know, people familiar with the West coast. A lot of it is mining. Um, and it was, it was great. I, I really enjoyed being at a midsize firm. I had opportunities to go to big four, but, but I chose the midsize because I, you know, well, I don't know how the recruiting goes today, but, but I really kind of bought into that. Hey, you get to really know everybody. Uh, and you get to own files early. And so I got a lot of responsibility on really small, like capital pool companies, which are TSX venture listed entities where I was sort of said like, Hey, here's the, here's an audit file, figure it out. Um, and, and so there's a lot of exposure and, and a lot of, a lot of cool things with that. Um, and I'll preface that by saying I, I ended my firm career at PwC and there's a ton of, there's a, there's a, you know, ton of examples of why that is an incredible path as well. So um, I kind of got the best of both worlds, but, but my move to uh, my move to Calgary, I went to core assurance again um, at BDO and I spent another year and a half or so there. And then I sort of got tired of audit specifically, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, and that's a common theme in my life is, is I don't really know what I want to do when I grow up. And, and that, that started at a young age uh, and continues to this day, I, I will admit. But, uh, but then I got an opportunity to go to PwC and I worked in, in what's called the Capital Markets Accounting Advisory Services uh, side of things, which is sort of a, um, a, it's under or it was under the assurance umbrella, but it was sort of consultancy as well. And uh, you got to help companies with CSOX and you got to help them with assurance and and non like non core assurance things and we did some different types of finance effectiveness and implementation stuff so I then spent 
oh, I don't know, six or seven years at PwC in that same group going from a senior up to senior manager uh, and got some really incredible opportunities. And, and the kind of the most impactful one is, is I took, a, took on a project down in Columbia. Um, and so I spent the last two years at PwC, I spent uh, 20, I did 22 trips to Bogota uh, back and forth. And I was spending, you know, 17 to 21 days in Columbia uh, each time. And that's really important because that's where I met my wife. And so she's Colombian. And, uh, and so it, like, there's no doubt that my, my trips to Colombia were longer after I met her. Like there's a direct correlation to the amount of, <laughs> Oh, I need to be down there. And, you know, and this is pre COVID, right? So, so there was, you know, it was that kind of consulting idea that you've got to be on a plane and you've got to be in person. And, and there's a lot of value to that. And, and that relationship piece is I got to know the CFO of the company that we were doing all the work for. Um, and he's a, he's a Calgarian. Um, and as a gringo coming down to do consulting in a primarily Latin or a Spanish uh, company, I just got to know David. His name's David Dick. I got to know him quite well because him and his wife were down there and they really wanted to just go out for dinner with somebody uh, who they could speak English with. And so I just got the opportunity to, to build a relationship with the CFO of, you know, one of the largest independent oil and gas companies in South America, um, and got to know them on a really personal level. And we kept on, you know, doing work together and we'd go, you know, we'd go for lunch and we'd go for dinner when, when I was down there, um, COVID hit, he left, moved back to Canada and, uh, and my wife and I, we eloped to Vegas. So I'm just kind of, you know, all over the place a little bit. But we eloped to Vegas, and then we then we uh, we moved back, and uh, we were in Calgary one day, and and David and Coralie knew we were there, and so we went for dinner with them. And David said, uh, "Look, I've got this. I'm I'm an investor in this fish company out in Halifax, and I'm looking for a CFO. Do you know anybody?" Uh, and I said, "No, I don't. I don't know anybody." He said, "Well, do you want to move to Halifax?" And I said, "No, I I just moved back to Vancouver. Like I just." You know, I, I'm with my family, and uh, and as as what typically happens when him and I are together, we drink a bit of wine. Um, and so when we left late that night, my wife had to drive us back uh, back to where we were staying, and she kind of looked at me and she said, uh, "Was he serious? Like, are are you? You know, was he?" And kind of brushed it off, but you know, David doesn't you know he doesn't joke about those things. Um, and I called him up. Uh, that was on a Friday. I called him up on Monday, and I said, "Hey, maybe we should have a conversation." And uh, it wasn't two weeks later that I had the job. Um, and really it happened quick, but, but it was because him and I had gotten to know each other and, and I knew his wife and I knew his kids and I knew his family, but we got to know each other on a personal level. And there was a, you know, don't get me wrong. We as a team performed well at work. Um, like if we didn't do that, there's no way yeah. that conversation takes place, but we got to know each other on a personal level and he trusted me and, and he kind of knew what my, I don't know, my, attributes word and, and how I work and he liked that and without that kind of foundational relationship he would have never offered or never talked about it um so so yeah that's how that's how this came to be um and so I was I was quite fortunate <clears throat> fortunate but again making your own fortune at the same time right like because here's the thing and I love that you pointed it out um my husband used to tell me and we used to talk about this because looking backwards, you can kind of put the pieces together. But like when you're in it, you're like, whoa, like how did this happen? Yeah. And kind of discovering like you're always interviewing for your next job at your current one, except it's not an interview. It's doing your job and yeah. people recognizing it. And, you know, if you do your job, your best that you can day after day and, you know, knowing that your best looks different every day, but day after day, if you're yeah. doing your job and delivering and you have a good attitude, like people want to work with people like that. And yeah. if you're not, I don't know, if you're not answering emails every five minutes, or if you're not, I don't know, um, you know, the most chipper morning person, but you're like authentic and you deliver and you deliver a good product and you're pleasant to be around, like that speaks for itself. And then, you know, job postings that, um, you know, were never public are all of a sudden, you know, sent to you. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not, you know, necessarily like, oh, you're you know, family connections or this or that or other things. It's like, no, you work for these opportunities and they, they pop up. And just because they're not evident to you or I, like it's, it's, it's there, it's a looking yeah. backwards. So I think it's really, really cool because sometimes you're in the thick of it. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll be in the thick of it and be like, oh goodness, like this is a little bit of a, a slog. And then, you know, kind of like two years later, you're like, wow, like this came from that. And it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. 
Oh, it is. And and I like I remember I was in the car when I got the phone call to say, hey, we need you to go to Columbia for the first time. And I hung up the phone and my my words weren't very PG appropriate because I was like, I don't it was the middle of summer and I was in Calgary and we were, you know, summer, yeah. summers are short in Calgary. I wanted to Were you on the river? Home. Were you like about to like go like rafting down the river? I was on like, my oh. I was on my way to Whitefish, Montana for a guy's <laughs> golf trip. And I got the phone call like half and, and that's a seven hour drive by itself. And so I got it like, you know, I was probably by, I don't know, med hat or something like that on my way down. Uh, and I got the phone call and I spent five hours in the car fuming because I had this <laughs> golf trip and then I had to fly like, like the Tuesday. Like, so I had to get to Whitefish and I had to book my flights and, and I was fuming about it. And I mean, my, my entire life has turned around because of it, not turned around. I shouldn't say like that, but, but it changed course because of it. Yeah. Uh, not just professionally, but also personally, because if I didn't do the job, I would have never met my wife. Um, so, totally. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Cause I just know now, like there's a student there that like in a year or two will like be, be somewhere and be like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, but, this, like, like, you know, the thing though is, is you got to show up though. Like you, you can be pissed off in the moment, but, but when you do show up, you've got to work hard and, and you can't, you know, if, if I had gone down to Columbia and, and done a crappy job, none of it would have happened. And, for me, that was a, like that, that's, you know, I'm not the best accountant. I'm, I'm probably not even a very good accountant, uh, but, but I work hard and, and I care about what I do, even if it's mundane. Uh, and that, uh, you know, being able to, to do that, these opportunities, because like, you're, you're right, like at the time I had no idea it would turn into this, but if I hadn't cared and worked hard and tried um, and put myself out there and make a lot of mistakes along the way, but if I didn't try, then it, it wouldn't have come, come through. Hey, uh, wild shot in the dark. Do you have a sports background? I do. Yeah. 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 I actually went to UBC on a football scholarship. Oh, uh, not okay. a very good one. Like, don't, don't quote that. I, I didn't actually <laughs> end up playing and it was like a $500 scholarship and I went to training camp and got beat up and walked away. Yeah. But no, at the sports thing though, I find when I went through articling, I think they picked up, um, a, I don't know what group I got, uh, kind of recruited through because my grades were like good but not great um but I played competitive sports and then so they I feel like they kind of pulled from a few and from a few groups and uh just I think they saw like a tie between competitive sports and being able to like slog it out in an audit room for three and a half years yeah Uh, EY Calgary EY okay yeah yeah um So yeah, so I kind of look at that and like, I, I don't know about you, but I attribute um, the best investment I ever made in my twenties was to my designation and mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, the debits and credits of what I learned, but just like how to work in teams, how yeah. to like go through a sucky time, how to work with like deadlines. And then from that, how to pick and choose projects, people, you know, the relationships and like, you know, the challenges. So you don't really get a lot of choice up front, but you work yeah. through it and kind of persevere. And then later on, when you do get a choice, you can kind of be like, okay, now's the season in my life where I don't mind grinding again, or now's right. the season in my life where I want to work with good people for less hours, for less money, you know? Yep. So I don't know. What, what do you think about that kind of investing like earlier on to kind of build that seed later? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think if you coast through um, and, and look, if you, you you probably didn't coast through high school to get into university and you're probably not going to get into the CPA program if you coasted through university and you're probably not going to go to a firm or get designated or, or work for a company because you coasted. So I think, you know, most people are who are listening to this probably work pretty hard, but um, those investments that you do earlier on and and the harder you try and the harder you fail, uh, you know, it, it, look, it, it my, my sister's always been a, a big help on that. And, and, you know, you fail quick and you fail early um, and you learn from it. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's a, you can take that from sports, but you can also put that through your work environment. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to, I think it's important to be wrong and to fail and to try, uh, but then to try again and to pick up and go again, like that adversity piece. And that's, that's a lot of what I learned at the firm was, you know, you spend an entire week doing a working paper and then you put it into review and you just get like coaching note and coaching note and everything you thought you did right oh i thought you were gonna say shit on and i was well, like yeah. i didn't know are, like, are we are we able to corrupt the youth with this because yeah yeah, you get, uh, yeah we're, we're very transparent it's important that they know what they're going into yeah, so that they like, can like yeah like you get shit on and you get shit on a lot <laughs> and and you think like you go in and you're like oh i just graduated and i know what i'm doing and then you do a working paper and like 
there's not one person who shits on you. There's like four. <laughs> like it goes to your senior and then your manager and the senior manager and then the partner and then maybe the quality of review and you get coaching notes the whole way. Like if you if you don't kind of build up that ability to to learn and to understand that that is part of the learning process, uh, it, it makes for a pretty short time. Uh, but that's what, you know, I, I think that the people who, who served me best in my career are the ones who coached me the hardest and gave me the hardest coaching notes and picked on me. Like, look, I detail orientation is not like, I'm not that great at it, but I learned that if you can't put together a pretty working paper, how can I trust that you can do the complex calculation that is behind it? And so, yeah, I had this one manager, I remember him to this day, he had a specific color blue, you had to write all your notes in. And he would check to make sure it was the exact blue. And it wasn't one of like the drop down blues. You had to go and find it. And to this day, I do every note with it still. Uh, and like a little like OCD, but, but you know, it, it was that thing. Like if you can't do the little things right, how are you going to do the big things? And if you're not going to take the feedback, uh, how are you going to grow from it? And so, yeah, the, the people who were, who, who kind of helped my growth the most were the ones, because if, if they're giving you coaching notes and if they're giving you um, coaching points, that means they care. And that means they're, they're trying to get you better. Yeah, no, completely. And, you know, somebody can sit here and say, well, like, that's not the case with me. Somebody gives me coaching notes uh, or feedback and they don't want me to succeed. Well, you know what? Boo on them. They just took time out of their life to give you yeah. notes, like use yeah. them and improve and, yeah. you know, and say, thank you. Yeah. Like feedback is cool. a gift. And uh, if somebody means it with a poor intent, whatever. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, trust me, there's, there's lots of people, not lots, yeah. but there are people like that, right? Like there's, there's, there's good and bad apples in every apple cart. Uh, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think if you can, if you can learn to, cause you can learn something from everybody, even if, you know, even if it's a very, you know, the guy likes the color blue, like a specific color blue, like, what did I learn from that? Is that the best blue? No, but did I learn that some people are really particular and it's, you know, does it make me better in an area that I'm weaker? Yeah. So, uh, and I, I still know the guy He's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then get I hate him at some points. Yeah, big time. <laughs> that also like denotes like closest in types of relationships. Uh, when you can, yeah, see the positives and then yeah. um okay. So really interesting. I like that you shared uh some examples because I would almost, if you're willing to, do you, does anything else come to mind? Any um, you know, fail, fail quick, fail often, fail hard, uh, and kind of items that come up. And if not, I can I can quickly corral this. Yeah, I I think um, one of the uh, one of the ones I I walked into a presentation for a client uh, and I thought I knew what I was talking about and I didn't like I thought I could skate through it I I like you know I I would consider you know when you when you're going through your career you got to kind of figure out what what you do well individually and and as you and I talk there's going to be some people who listen that say yeah look I I played sports too and I did this and that resonates and there's other people who won't and so you got to kind of figure out. Hey, what do you do well, and what's your secret sauce, right? Uh, and and part of mine is I'm I, I think I've got a bit more personality than what people think when they come to an accountant. So so I'm not the best accountant, like, and I'll tell you that a hundred times. But I I should be able to translate accounting to non-accounting people, and that's kind of what I do. Uh, and I walked into a, a presentation with a client, and I I thought I knew the accounting, and I didn't. Uh, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that I didn't know what I was talking about. And, and then you lose all credibility. Like you, you lose your, you know, I, I had my little speech, but I didn't know it deep enough to say like, look, I can answer a question on this. Uh, and I didn't anticipate questions and I didn't prep for it. And so, so that was a, that was a pretty strong kick in the teeth for me. Uh, and it just, you know, my takeaway was you got to be prepared. Like I, I, I'm not good enough to not be prepared and walk into one of those meetings. I don't know. And it, like it was a IFRS conversion. It was going from like ASPE to IFRS and it was on pp and &E And I, you know, I just didn't know it well enough. So. Oh, that is, that is so relatable um, uh, for so many reasons. And sometimes you have to give yourself a little bit of uh, grace too, because uh, like I've, I've prepared for things where I felt like I was prepared at the time, but then when you go into it, you quickly realize that you weren't. But there was no way for me, at least, to know mm -hmm. that I had to do more or differently had I not right. gone through that next item. And sometimes you get caught and found out, and sometimes you're able to kind of not. Yeah. And But you need to learn that lesson either way and just say, okay, just because it didn't have a bad result this time doesn't mean I didn't, there aren't things I can do in the future. Um, yeah. 
And so I think it's so important to, to learn, even if it's not a big like mess up and learn from others. Uh, and so oh. to your point, maybe people resonate with this and us that, you know, played sports or maybe they're like, Hey, piano or acting, or they can see yeah. these different items. Um, I will agree. Maybe our detail oriented people are like, they're, this is driving them crazy because like I have things off like balance or cause I'm also not, uh, I'm not the most detail oriented, uh, yeah. but I also believe in like, how do I say this? Um, if you're not able to kind of see the bigger picture and know where things work in, it's a skill to be like, okay, this isn't perfect. We can address it later, but the big wins are there and then yeah. own that. And yeah. then, you know, you'll find out along the way, if like there's a new blue that needs to be used or like me, I had a director that liked a certain formatting on a certain spreadsheet. And I was like, yeah bring it on, like yeah. happy to use your formatting. I should have asked this before the meeting, before I did like, you know, those 80 hours worth of work on it. That's on me. Yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. All good. Yeah. Okay. Chris, I would love to um, know I, as CFO, like what does it look like day to day um, in, or week to week or month to month or year to year in your life? And do you do as much accounting as people think? Uh, so I, ooh, what does it look like? It, it, yeah. um, that's a good question. Uh, because we're small, uh, it looks like a lot of things. And so when I started, when, when I came in, we had an outsourced accounting firm who did all the bookkeeping and we've since brought that in house. And, and I actually just hired, uh, our third accounting staff and she's a manager of financial reporting. Um, so from, from that over the 18 months, my job has sort of gone from AP clerk uh, all the way up to CFO. Um, so really what, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think any, any one CFO job is the same. Like if you go and you're the CFO of Suncor Energy or of Dalhousie, like it, it, that's going to be a very different, very different experience. But, uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity and I, I do see it as an opportunity to do everything within our accounting team uh, so that I know when I can set it up how I want. So a lot of what I do today is, is sort of setting up our accounting function, how I would like it to be. And I spent a lot of time doing that at PwC. So, so I've got an idea, but, you know, I was doing consulting for big multinational energy companies that doesn't really apply to a team of four uh, with 45 people across Atlantic Canada. It's a very different scale. So um, so yeah, a lot of my day is on the phone. You know, I, I spend, well, I spend three hours a day on the phone probably with different people. Uh, we're always fundraising. Like we're always looking for, for money. Um, we had an AGM, our first AGM in a while on Tuesday. So I presented to the shareholder group. Um, we did some legal stuff. Investor relations is a big part of it. Like at least once a day, I'm talking to somebody, um, on either the fundraising or the, uh, updates to our shareholder group. Uh, and then really kind of what, what I've, trying to focus on is bringing more of a sort of professional attitude to our back end team. So not that we, we just didn't have a back end team, so we can build it how we want. So what is everything that goes out to our teammates and what do we need? So how do we improve the data collection on the marine side? How do we improve data collection on the freshwater side? And then how do we, you know, report that into management and how do we do payroll better? So it's it's pretty dynamic um, and it's a lot of different things, but I don't think it, well, I don't know uh, because I haven't been a CFO anywhere else, but it's probably, it's probably very different across every, every role and every organization. And I think even just saying that and recognizing that is of large value because uh, like I surveyed my intro students uh, this fall and I said, who here wants to be the CFO or CEO of a company? And we got like, I'd say like over half of the people raising okay. their hands. Yeah. And I was like, cool. Um, and I'm like, by the end of class, I'll show you how you become the CEO or CFO of your own company. <laughs> and they were like, what? And yeah. so it was on a shareholders equity and like starting up a corporation. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, um, titles, titles are important. They communicate a number of things, but understanding the role and understanding the functions, um, are, are, you know, really where it's at. So yeah. I would say that for some people that I talk to, um, being the CFO of Suncor would be, um, I'm sorry, Suncor, uh, yeah. and it would be like, <laughs> they would be like, no, like, how did I wind up here? Like it's, um, and like your job would be a dream job and like vice versa. So 
I think it's really, really important to recognize that, you know, there are scales, there's diversity, that it's not just, oh, this is a job, this is what they do. Right. Um, and within that, I really think it's neat how, you know, being an advisor and being consulting for multinational um, and international like corporations, for large corporations, um, you've been able to kind of see, well, if they would have set it up like X, Mm -hmm. then by the time it grew, you know, it wouldn't look like this. So I think it's super awesome. And like you said, an opportunity to start off, you know, doing the payroll, doing, um, you know, uh, the payables and kind of understanding those functions and then building them as you wish and with those integration activities in mind. So I think that that's super cool. Yeah, it, it's cool. The, the thing for me too, is that this was a brand new industry. Like aquaculture is, is new to me and, and it's not a well- like there, there's a lot of aquaculture that goes on in Canada, but not the same as in Norway um, or Chile or some of the other kind of large international places. And so the best I found one of the best ways for me to really understand what was going on was to get into the weeds of all of it, to, to see invoices come through and understand, well, what is this? And and I've been you know, I work with a great CEO uh, who's been very patient with me and getting me up to speed. And, and we work well together because he's operational and, and very science based. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he, like, when you say I for us around him, he cringes, like he just cringes, he, he hates it. Uh, and so, so I, I can take some of that kind of burden off of him. And, and he's been yeah fantastic to, to get me up to speed on, on, you know, what we actually do, because if you don't understand that you can set up the best process in the world, but it may not be fit for purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I've, yeah, it's good to, good to know. Um, so when we first talked, I remember talking a bit about, uh, the product about, uh, I like how you call it single protein. So, um, you did not know that despite being born and bred Calgary and I worked at Red Lobster, which we are, uh, so yes. So while many people were all about, uh, the salmon and black yeah. and salmon, we had a uh, trout that has, um, a meat, it's salt and pepper trout, I believe, or like lemon pepper, lemon pepper trout is very uh, popular. And while some people feel like trout has a strong taste, like salmon has a strong taste. It also has, I think, more protein or just as much protein as salmon. And it's yeah. lean and it's delicious. And it packs like great, um, you know, recovery fuels for the bodies. Any uh, any kind of want to pitch or anything I missed on trout? Because I, I am a big believer in trout. Yeah. So, so very, uh, thank you for being a believer. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's big. We, we like trout for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of them that you mentioned in terms of interchangeability with salmon, it's, it's almost identical. Like a, a, the, the average consumer, uh, if they saw a fillet of steelhead trout and they saw a fillet of Atlantic salmon, they'd have a very difficult time knowing which is which. Uh, and, and I would, venture a guess to say more people would actually pick the trout because it's got a bit of a deeper red color to it uh so it, it looks nicer uh we yeah we're we're a big believer in trout we we think there's a huge market demand for it a uh, trout is a very uh sustainable protein and, and it works really well in the aquaculture environment uh specifically where we do some of our operations we we don't have the same issue uh with sea lice and with some of the diseases that some of the salmon farmers do based on location and also based on species and so we love it and, and we want more people to eat trout and we think more people will because uh, we've got pretty big growth plans to, uh, to, to not, not take over the salmon market, but there is growing demand for consumers to eat healthy and sustainable protein. Uh, our protein happens to be really close to the market. I mean, we're, our marine sites are in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Um, our competitors are bringing the same product from Norway and Chile. Uh, so we've got a freshness advantage, a carbon footprint advantage, uh, and a shelf life advantage, Not and also a cost advantage because it's a whole lot cheaper to truck a product than it is to fly it fresh from Norway or from Chile. So um, I, I think you'll you'll see more and more trout in, in the supermarkets going forward. And, and you know, we've got, we've got some plans to maybe even see an ocean trout brand one of these days um, and, uh, and lots of different product formats. I love that. That makes me really excited. I did. Um, I've been involved a bit with um, the Dalhousie uh, Agri-Food Analytics Lab and oh, looking cool. at the food yeah. pricing report for 2023 yeah. and, uh, you know, speaking a bit about also finances and budgeting uh, for consumers and what do you do in the face of you know, 10.3, 10.2% of food inflation for 2022. And the biggest thing is like, listen, we're not sure, like we can't prove at this point um, whether or not there is greedflation in the markets or not, whether or not grocers are taking advantage of, 
you know, the higher inflationary times to pass through even more uh, costs um, to consumers through prices. But one thing that we are recommending is like, hey, like be flexible. If you yeah. go and you're like, hey, we'd like some fish today, like go and like look what's, you know, what's fresh, what's cost effective, you know, shopping local obviously has some advantages, both from not only the pricing, um, but also you mentioned shelf life. Shelfflation is huge. And that's a little bit of a hidden cost that people aren't quite aware of necessarily. Um, and that with all the supply chain issues, it's taken longer times for products to get to the yeah. stores. And then it'll take even less. So then that means there's less time for people to have it in their fridge before they can use it. Yeah. So I, I am a little bit passionate about this as like a personal finance and budgeting nerd, as well as like, yeah. it's what's around me. And it's the three big things. It's housing, transportation, and food. We can't yeah. really avoid it. So how do you minimize that? And then if you have the big three taken care of, you know, you can kind of, I don't know, just like buy a six pack of beer and not like really worry too, too much about it. If you're not, you know, every month spending extra hundreds of dollars at the grocery store. Oh, and it, it's huge. You know, we were, so I will say this, a little plug for Trout is I was at a, one of the big box wholesale stores in, in Halifax earlier this week. Uh, and and trout fillets were at 19.99 a kilogram, and the same salmon uh, size was at like 35 dollars a kg. And uh, there is, you know, there. I I would suggest the next time you or or any of your listeners are at said big box store, give the trout a try, because uh, yeah. I think most people would be really pleasantly surprised by it. Um, but it 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 you know what I what scares me the most is is for consumers with the with the pricing that's going on is people are going to make different choices in what they eat. And typically the cheaper choice in a lot of cases is the more expensive choice or sorry, is the unhealthier choice. Uh, and yeah. so we, you know, there's, there's some long-term impacts if people have to make the choice of, you know, something that's fresh, like, you know, the, the big thing about cauliflower heads going to, you know, five or $6 or $7 per head. Uh, so if somebody doesn't choose that and they choose something else because it's cheaper, like the bag of, the bag of frozen French fries, uh, in is still you know relatively inexpensive in comparison. Uh, so there you know there could be you know individual choices that people are making today could set bad habits and then also could set long term health issues uh, as they go forward. And that's uh, you know those impacts are you know four times down the road, but oh. it's big. Oh, completely. Um, and I, I love how like looking at the big picture is po possibly um, you know related to your role as an accountant and like a CA, CPA, like that, but also perhaps like your political science underground because everything ha is interconnected. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the dominoes. So I asked my cost management students this term, their third, fourth year accounting, finance, management, um, and or MBA or PhD students. And I asked them what a cost was. And um, they were, you know, they came back with like, oh, an economic outlay of resources. And then I was like, are there other types of costs? Mm -hmm. And like these students, I'm like, man, like you are beyond like heads and tails above where I was uh, when, I, when I was your age. Uh -huh. they, we started talking about environmental costs, health costs, um, opportunity costs as far as lifestyle and relationship. Yeah. Like they just, they get it. And yeah. so um, I agree being really cognizant. What is a, tr what is a substitute um, and a reasonable substitute versus what is a trade-off? Um, and are you perhaps is there a better trade-off than you can make or a better substitute that you can make that won't have that long-term cost because yeah. before you know it the long term will be here yeah. and um you know the, the more kind of shifts that you make earlier on in your life the more that those habits stack up it can either be positive habits or it can be habits that will have great great costs later totally, on so totally. thank you for bringing that up yeah yeah well i mean i wish i had exercised more in university and, and got that habit down earlier because those are those ones, right? You, you stack them on each other. And, and by the time you get to our age, um, you, you may look a whole lot better than I do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, this, uh, this picture of what was it? Uh, Martha Stewart came out and it's like, no face left. And I was like, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. Right? Like, like, she's like, on time. <laughs> yeah. Like she's, yeah, she's, yeah. It's That's good. impressive. Okay. Chris, Chris, I'm ex I'm I want we've heard a lot about um your past, um, your career as an accountant, which is all interesting and exciting. But I'm really interested to hear like what do you 
do you, do you have fun? Is there time for fun? Like, what do you get up to? Yeah. Yeah. There's time for fun. Uh, I try and play a lot of golf. Uh, I play less golf than I want, but, but I try and play a lot of golf. Uh, and, uh, we take our dog out every day and we go for walks and we're, uh, so we're actually expecting our first child, uh, in about 10 weeks. And so, congratulations! Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So it's uh, you know, like, it's this balance of like excitement and fear and, and we yeah. oscillate between, between them minute by minute, it feels like. Um, but yeah, no, like there's, there, we work hard and, and, uh, and I work, work a lot of hours, but, but it allows us to kind of do a lot of the things we want to do for fun, uh, which yeah, for, you know, hanging out with people, going and grabbing a beer, exploring a new city, exploring a new province, like the East coast is brand new for us. Uh, so, so we spend, you know, a bunch of time taking a long weekend and going to try and figure out, Hey, what, what is here? Um, and making the best of the surroundings. Cause this is a pretty world-class area. Oh, it completely is. And I, I'm not going to lie. I still have places that like, we would like to go out and uh, explore because I feel like there's this like even PEI, like I haven't been, he has. And like, I am like, oh, there's just so much there. The red yeah. beaches, uh, like, yeah. yeah, there's just so much all around. I still have my like little list. I blame it on COVID, um, but also like a little bit of time management, but really recognizing that you don't have to hop on a plane to go have some really cool experiences. There's a lot just in our backyard. Yeah, there's tons. There's tons. Yeah. And, and maybe like, just like take the you know, take the long route, like don't just take yeah. the highway 101 or 102, right? Like go on some of the back roads and just see what you find. And I only say that because I go to PEI maybe once a month because we've got a facility out there and I've seen barely any of it because it's just kind of get in and get out, but there's so much to see along the way. Yeah. No, I think that's going to make, uh, make some time to just, Oh, go what an accountant. I'm like to make a list. Of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. But even more so, like just block out, block out the calendar. Just like see, see what can make it work. Be purposeful yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So you you're here for 18 months. There's, you know, uh baby on the way in 10 weeks. Uh maybe now is or is the perfect time to talk about future plans and options that you're considering. And maybe it's not, but I'm just gonna pull it out there. Like what's you know, what do you have? What thoughts do you have for like your future? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it involves a lot of diaper changes right now, yeah, um, but uh, probably nobody wants to think about that. So from like, we're, we're doing a lot of cool things at Ocean Trout. Um, we've, we've got more fundraising to do. We'd like to grow this into sort of a multinational business uh, because we've got some really incredible assets. And so I, you know, I see, you know, there's probably a five year plan to get us to a stage where where we we then it it it's a bit of a treadmill with with aquaculture. So once you once you get it to the size you want, you just you kind of stay there. Up until then it's a lot of work to get there. And so really, you know, we're we're looking at building ocean trout and continuing to build on what we've done over the past 24 to 18 months as well. And so from a career perspective, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds, but I really like this kind of space of this mid-market um, and have have the ability to put your fingerprint on a lot of different things. And uh, the cool thing is there's there's a lot of these companies out there that, that have founders or they have um, people who can run the business, but they don't want to do the IFRS and they don't want to deal with the auditors. And they, you know, I can learn a little bit of that business and then also, you know, take on the stuff that they really don't want to do. So, you know, I... I no offense to Suncor, but I don't really want to be the CFO of Suncor at some point. Uh, but I do like these these kind of smaller areas where it's it, you know you can really wrap your head around and put your arms around it. That that's a good way to put it, right? Like, how do you understand a Suncor? Like that thing's a beast. Like, yeah. I I think that's yeah. <laughs> like what what like what when you see an invoice come in, you're like, what is that? And it'll take you probably like it would take me like a day to figure out what that is. Yeah. And then I would now understand. Okay, that's a part of the part of the part. Um, but then I would still not understand the part or the part that it yeah. like went to. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, oh goodness. Whereas like yeah. here, uh, yeah, lots of lots of learning and growing uh, from the operational side, possibly you know, and bringing into together that strategic side. Um, hey, random little bit of a mm -hmm. random question with that is, a number of students will say, hey, I'm going to you know, mid-sized firm, or hey, I'm going to a small firm, or hey, I'm going to industry, uh, hey, I'm going to a big firm, and then ask me, is this the right move? And I don't know about you, but the way I always answer is like, well, what, like, what's your goal in five years? Mm -hmm. Like how, it, and what, what I'm looking for there is like, I'm like, do you want to live and work internationally? 
because if they do, then you'd want to find a company that has some public public companies, whether it's TSXV yeah. or TSX or, you know, NASDAQ, like you'd want to have that international and um, that IFRS experience. You'd want to have that, you know, perhaps US gap or, you know, kind of that mobility. But if somebody is like, hey, I want a stable job and I want it to, you know, I'm to be the relatively same year after year after year. Um, and it would almost be like, okay, maybe it's a small firm, a mid-sized firm or, you know, industry. Yeah. I don't know what kind of beyond that, what are some kind of considerations that recent grads or that, you know, soon to be grads might be able to look to when trying to pick the job out of university where they do want to pursue their CPA, but don't quite know if it's the right place for them. Yeah. I, I, I would probably default to the right place. Doesn't have to be perfect. And it also doesn't have to be permanent. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a great example. I, I started a midsize or a, you know, small midsize firm and then went back into a big four and some people go big four and they go midsize and they go back or they kind of boomerang around. I think, you know, it's that, that, what do you want to do in five years or where do you want to be in five years will always change. And, and I, I remember being 22 and graduating and not knowing what I wanted to do. And then I remember being 27 and not knowing what I wanted to do. And, you know, now I'm coming up in my mid thirties and I, you know, I don't really know what I want to do, but, but part of it is learning as you go. And as those different, you know, things become more clear to you and maybe it's live in, you know, oh, I want to go live in Europe or I want to work in this, or I want to do that. You can always make a change to get to that place. So, so if you go to, you know, you go to a mid-sized firm and you get no IFRS experience and no public company experience, and you decide a couple of years down the road, like, Hey, I really want to, I want to go work for, uh, IFRS compliant company, and I want to take a company public, you can always then, you know, make that jump back into a firm that would maybe provide you with that or into a company that that is doing that, um, because there's lots of those around. So, so I, I think, you know, if you can find a place that you can learn, and if you can find a place that will give you opportunities to do different things and challenge yourself, you can just refine and continue to figure out what you want to do and, and make the changes along the way to get there. Um, so, yeah. I... Love it. No, because even in like CPA, I hear a number of students that are like, well, I'm in industry. I don't think I want to work in public practice, but I'm thinking about doing assurance uh, day two um, so that I can possibly go there in the future. And I'm just like, Whoa, that is a lot of like risk and a lot of um, like skills being built in a direction just in case. And I right. feel like as accountants, a lot of times we want to do things like you know, to like mitigate risk, but if you can almost be like cool with like, you know, a little bit of risk in a relatively like quote, safe profession, I, to me, that's kind of the sweet spot. And I say a little bit of risk to me, like, this is what I think I want to do. I'm going to build the skills towards that. And I'm going to be okay with, as you said, if that changes, going to pick up those skills when it changes, because yeah. it's not like you lose all this, you bring yeah. it along with you and you can go build onto that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that entire time, you got to be working on your kind of soft skills, wow. right? Like you got to be figuring out, like, do I, you know, do you like working really hard? Do you want to get into the weeds? Uh, are you going to do the right thing when no one's looking? Like you, you got to be working on all those things because those are the transferable ones that, you know, technical accounting, like if you, if you learn ASPE and you want to go learn IFRS, that, that, that is a, that's a very easy skill to learn. Uh, but if you want to do that, You've got to be able to bring all these other pieces around trustworthiness and hard work and and the desire to learn and being a good teammate and doing all of that so that because those are the ones that get you hired into the next role and those technical skills you'll you'll pick up um but but you have to bring the, the baggage you bring has to be good baggage right absolutely all right are you ready for some rapid fire yeah. questions yeah, now the yeah. rapid fire questions you can give however long answers but you're ready right. all right uh chris Grimes Gord, do you regret completing your CPA? No, not at all. No, not for a second. Do you want do you want rapid fire answers or do you want like full whatever answer? whatever you want to give? Um, well, there, there's a but if it's a, yeah, there with with a designation, there's a level of credibility that that you show up to every meeting with, uh, and yeah. uh, and some people think that the you know accountants suck and we don't like them, uh, but for the most part, it's a really well regarded one. So yeah, I, not for a second. Well, now we have like the, if you don't like accountants, like you can go FTX it, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, okay. What advice do, would you give for current DAL um, management learners? They can be accounting majors or management learners in general. Uh, oh, that's broad. That's broad. I know. Like, um, so I would say get your education done and do as well as you can during it. Um, and then, and then figure out what you bring to the table, like, and, and lean into those skills. Um, yeah. Lean into, are you, or did, like, do you resonate with what we're talking about and you're an ex athlete who wants to not be a really technical accountant and who can translate that? Cause that's what I did. I leaned into that. So I, yeah. you know, I learned as much of the technical as I, as I can, but man, you don't want to put a IFRS 15 memo in front of me, but like it, it just won't, it won't get done very well. It'll get done fine, but, or maybe you're the other way and, and you say, look, I just want to be in the weeds and I want to do the technical accounting uh, and find your kind of magic sauce, like figure out what you want to yeah. do and, and how you're going to do it well, because, you know, you're going to gravitate to to something, but the CPA and, and accounting in general, I think is a great, great basis for, for really anything in business. I love hearing you say that because a number of students will like confess to me that they're like, I don't really like doing debits and credits. And I was like, cool. Yeah. Do you think I do? <laughs> and they're just like, what? And I'm like, it's a way to communicate. It's a way to trans like yeah. transfer something. And it's important, but it's not like, it's not your destiny for 20 years if you don't want it to be like yeah. to, to debit and credit or like write a IFRS 15 memo. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely agree. Hey, um, how do you know when it's the right time to move on um, from jobs? Because as you've disclosed, you've had a, had a few, not a lot, yeah. like just you. Yeah. I, I, um, when the right opportunity comes up, like, like I've never made a move for money. Um, like it's never been about, it's never been about like financial reward. It's always been about what's the right fit for me. Um, and so, so, you know, starting in Vancouver and then going to Calgary at BDO and then going to PwC, it was, you know, it, it just, it, you sort of feel it like, and, and that's that refinement of, Hey, what do you want to do in five years is, well, I don't want to do political science because I don't want to be a lawyer. And then it, you know, I don't want to be an auditor and I don't want to be an internal audit and I don't want to be, you know, specific financial reporting. So that, so yeah, it, I don't know if there's a way, but I, I do think people look to move too quick typically. And, and that's from my time at the firm is, you know, you get designated and, Hey, I want to go make 20 or 30% more at Suncor, you know, or whatever that company is. And that's a big thing in Calgary, right? you got oil and gas companies that pay really well uh, that the firms don't keep up with. Uh, and, you know, where are you going to learn? Like what, what do you want to learn and where are you going to learn and who are you going to work with? So. Yeah. Um, and what I'm hearing is too, like being like going to something and not from something, which yeah, that's a great I way feel to like if, Yeah. And thank you. Cause like, I I've definitely done both. But the ones that I've like have resonated me with was when I was going to something, yeah, right? Yeah. And it was like, oh, I, you know, I kind of put a pin in this, you know, but I, I, I didn't look too far too fast. Like you take your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, I'm a look. I'm a big firm believer because that's the way that I came up. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing I loved about the firm is that there's so many people who can teach you so many different things. And so if you're in core assurance at a firm, whether it's a big or small or mid size you can go do something else. You want to do a bit of tax, you want to do a bit of consulting, you want to do, like there's so many different avenues and the firm has so many ways to learn. And so, yeah, I, I like the firm because I could I could spend a lot of time and try a lot of different things, uh, but I spent a lot of time. Yeah. yeah, That's a good point. Yeah, you're kind of like, you have to try out a few different careers before you have to like pick one. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. All right. Uh, are you a big like book reader, podcast um, listener? Like what what kind of consumables uh, do you like to read or listen to and any ones that you want to share for students or recent grads? Yeah. So I, most of my reading now is, is just to get my mind off things. So it's like, you know, you're Tom Clancy or, you know, very, very typical type type authors. Uh, but, but the ones that, and I, I thought about this is I went back and I started rereading some of Malcolm Gladwell's work. Um, and, and I, you know, David and Goliath, I, I picked up again and, um, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I take out of it that I enjoy. Um, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a Malcolm Gladwell fan. I like the way he looks at things. I know that there's some critique on some of his writing and some of his thoughts on the academic side of things, but, um, I, I enjoy it. And, and Was he, I, I, he outliers, he's outliers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I haven't yeah. read about David and Goliath. I'm putting it down on my list, but I did enjoy, uh, outliers and listen, if, if you don't have people that critique your work, then, you know, 
Yeah. I, I don't know. You haven't made it, right? Yeah. I would be honored when somebody rips apart oh, yeah. something I've written. Yeah, yeah. If someone's writing something bad about it, at least they're writing about it. So, uh, but yeah. I, I do, I, I'm a big fan of Gladwell because I, I like the way he looks at things. So I, you know, I listen to his podcast, Revisionist History and, and those, um, listen to like a lot of Planet Money and NPR type type things, like nothing, nothing too crazy. Uh, but the other one, uh, a really good book is Grit by Angela Duckworth. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's kind of that same idea of you, you got to kind of lay your foundation. You got to work really hard. And, and those are, those are the things that make people successful. It's not your, you know, your skills that you're born with. It's what you do with what you're born with. So, Love that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of success, Chris, um, what is your definition of success? Well, it, it, that changes by every year. I, I think, you know, success, success, is holistic and and that's what i've learned more recently is that uh success isn't just about getting the promotion at work for me um it's not about getting the raise it's not about getting the bonus uh or getting a title it, it's you know how do you how do you enjoy that but then also enjoy the rest of your life for the rest of my life i should say um and uh and that i'm sure that's going to change in 10 weeks um, because our world is is being turned upside down and, and success probably is going to look a whole lot more like the success of, of what our what happens with our child. Um, so I, I think, you know, defining success for for yourself is really important because then you can make the right choices as, as you look at different opportunities. Um, but it, again, it's going to change and it's going to be refined as you go. And as you get older, like, you know, when I was coming out of university, it, oh, I want a big paycheck, like that's success. But you know, and, and, and for a lot of people, it still is, but what if you can't enjoy it or you've got no way to enjoy it? I, I don't know if that's, well, that's not my definition. Yeah, I, I love it. It's, it is meant to be like a personal question, right? And that's, that's why it's like difficult. And, but I love that. Yeah, it's going to change. And for me, it's, it changes. And um, I, I want it to change. Like, I don't want to be the same human. And 40 years that I am right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, then that, then I haven't like learning and, and, you know, pursued the growth that is important to me. Yeah. All right. So last, last question, um, Chris, uh, any final comments or anything else to add? I, you know, just thinking about the audience, we've all been, you know, 20, early twenties and, or mid twenties for, for some students or thirties, uh, and and looking at kind of graduation and not really knowing what to do or what you want to do. Um, and that's really common. Like you're not alone in that. Um, and and that joke about what do you want to do when you grow up? Like I, I, I've interviewed people and I've hired a bunch of people. And that's the first question I asked them. Uh, and we're kind of getting too old to like, or, or maybe society would think we're getting too old to ask and answer that question. But um, it's, it, it's iterative. Like it's, there's no, for me, at least there's no one size that fits all and, and there's no direct line. It's, you know, it's up and down and around and it may swirl and it may go back to go and, or you may not cross go and you have to go to jail and come back around. Like, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ebbs and flows. Yeah. And, and if you asked me at 22, when I graduated university, if at 31, I'd move to Halifax and be the CFO of a company that we're trying to take public, I probably would have laughed. Um, but, but, you know, you can't imagine it, but you just kind of take what comes and, and you redefine as you go and keep on trying to figure out what you want to do. I love it. Hey, uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, after we press stop, I'll get your contact information of what I can link down below. And are people cool to reach out if they want for to sure. say hi or have any questions? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, like the, the nice thing about kind of the accounting profession is that there's a lot of people who want to give back and they want to connect and happy to share stories and um, those are, yeah, those are important relationships and, and, uh, yeah, I, I, it, people helped me all through along the way. And I had some great conversations when I was young, uh, with, I mean, we're still young, but, uh, when I was first starting out, uh, I, uh, yeah, so happy to help and happy to chat and see where it all goes. Perfect. Thanks, yeah. Chris. Yeah. You're welcome.